Okay. Welcome back from the holidays and uh, for the short ones. And uh, today we uh, we're going to open a new topic. That is one of the, if you remember the, the survey we did at big, uh, before the beginning of the course, uh, one of the topics that was uh, uh, raised uh, was that uh, you did, most of you didn't have any background in web technologies and HTML, and uh, you discovered that uh, some of it uh, is needed both for creating the website of the course uh, and mainly for creating, in many cases, the user interface uh, of your uh, project. Okay. So today and uh, in a couple of other lectures uh, further on, we'll uh, uh, show, uh, we'll describe what are the technologies behind uh, the, the web applications and in general, what are the protocols, just to understand mainly the architecture of these systems to be able to build our own architecture using these protocols and, uh, and standards. And of course, we'll also see which libraries we can use, I mean, which toolkits we can use in Python uh, to uh, realize some of web, web applications. So today, I'll try to split uh, the, the class in two. In the first part, I'll try to give you the general picture about the web architectures. Some of it may be already known or something that you more or less know, uh, but it will be the ground on which uh, we will build in the second hour uh, the practical uh, knowledge about the framework that we are going to use. Okay, so um, by the way, the, today we'll talk mainly about uh, user-facing web applications. So web applications that uh, are meant to be used by some user with a mouse, with a screen, with a keyboard, okay? But the same technologies we will find in a couple of weeks uh, are also the fabric for uh, integration of different subsystems. So you will discover, we will discover that uh, the easiest way of letting your maybe mobile application talk to the same uh, gateway on which you have the back, the back end of the, of the application, all the database, the easiest way is to use web technologies. So we will use the HTTP and all the rest of the web uh, technologies as a, uh, as a transport uh, a uh, standard transport uh, for integrating different applications. Hmm? And uh, so uh, this will be the, mm, the, the, the part about the REST architectures and so on. So it, it's easier to understand them if uh, you think the web is uh, one person navigating at that. But uh, the, uh, the technology that we are we will start to, to see today will be much more powerful than this, much more than creating user interfaces. Okay, um, first of all, uh, uh, let's navigate uh, in this hour through the web architecture. Um, web architecture is, uh, well, you, we, we defined a couple of times ago what we mean by architecture uh, when discussing about software systems. An architecture is a description of the main components uh, and their interconnection which are the components, what they do, and what they communicate to each other and how they do that. Hmm? Uh, the web is not something static, by, uh, on the other hand, so it's not easy to say what is the web architecture, the, the current web architecture. Uh, if you want to have a look, uh, there is this nice uh, website, uh, uh, which is not very easy to navigate in this uh, limited resolution, that uh, shows you more or less uh, all the different technologies that are playing a role in web systems today. With our years of definition, you see that the first, the web was started in 1991. Before that, nothing existed. HTTP was invented in 1991, HTML also at the end of 1991, the beginning of 1992. And each of these uh, technologies has a different uh, snake <laughs> in this picture that shows uh, the different versions. So HTTP version uh, 
0 0.1, 0 0.9, 1, and so on. Uh, and you see that these technologies are still continuing today. And uh, so these are the, all the snakes, snake-like shapes, technologies, SSL, JavaScript, Flash, HTML3, XML, and so on. Each snake is a technology. Each line, horizontal line, is a, a browser. And so you will see every browser when it started to support a given technology. So the crossing of the snakes with the browser is the uh, initial support of that browser for that technology. That's why they go up, up and down. And uh, of course, why we moved on the right, what we discover is that new technologies come into play, here, there, new ones, okay? New browser start appearing, Firefox is quite recent, 2004. Google Chrome is even more recent. There is an explosion here of new technologies, uh, starting with uh, CSS3 and uh, HTML5 uh, and some uh, touch uh, mm, uh, technologies uh, coming from the mobile world and so on. So you see that these snakes become more and more convoluted. And, uh, um, and the bad part of this picture is that uh, you don't see any of these technologies disappearing. If you go from left to right, you see that the number of technologies that you see, the number of colors, the number of snakes, keeps increasing. So every year, every month, there are new technologies that are needed and are used to, to build, uh, say, modern web applications, but all the previous technologies are still used also. So there's an adapt. No, there's not, there will not be a moment in which you say, okay, let's reset it from the beginning, let's throw everything away and start from the beginning with a cleaner solution. So it's a mix of different solutions and none of them is going to disappear. Okay, so this uh, gives us an idea of the complexity of what we are trying to, to accomplish. Uh, basically, today we'll try to jump back in time and uh, to 2000, year 2000 or so, or so. Okay, so before the advent of the Web 2.0, uh, and we will do it next week. So for today, we will concentrate on a handful of technologies, some of these, the ones that are more, say, all the older ones, hmm? but uh, they are also the, the more uh, fundamental ones. And we will add the new technologies, in particular uh, CSS and uh, AJAX and JavaScript uh, uh, later on, uh, because it's actually it's a, it's a very complex uh, uh, addition of different technologies. Okay, so that's what for the picture. Hmm? We are trying to walk from left to right, uh, more or less, uh, this picture, and see what are the main ingredients in that. Um, the idea is that, the basic idea is that uh, uh, web applications are multi-level architectures, in which uh, each level has a specific role, and uh, Mainly, they are separated by the, some network, infra, network infrastructure. So usually we have one client side, which can be the browser running on your computer, that connects to some server side on the other side of the world through the internet infrastructure. So this green internet infrastructure is all the has to do with the network connectivity. All the TCP IP protocol, all the um, connectivity providers, Wi-Fi or mobile or, uh, or uh, Ethernet or, or ADSL or anything else. This will be totally transparent to us in the, at the web technology level. In the web technologies, we see browsers that communicate with the servers. And this is the main, uh, let's say, nature of uh, the web infrastructure. 
A clear protocol which is independent of on the transport level, is independent on the network level, that enables any kind of browser to connect to any web server. On the back end, so on the server side, the web server itself, what we call a website, maybe a web server, is composed of different layers. And we'll see uh, uh, all of them, uh, the front end level uh, of the back end, so the web server, the application server, database servers, and so on, or maybe integrate also, will also integrate external services. Uh, so while we program, develop web applications, we need to work at this level here. Into the server, writing code for responding to client requests. The browser is a standard component. Hmm? Uh, actually, as, as we said before, the, the web technologies are also a way for creating other types of applications. So it's more and more frequent to have some web clients that are not browsers. Maybe it's your mobile application that needs to query some information or insert a da some data or so on. So it will use the same infrastructure, but in this case, the, <coughs> sorry, the client is not a general browser, but it's a specific application. All the rest of the infrastructure is the same, but the, 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 the kind of data that is exchanged will change. So we make, uh, we, we keep this picture in mind and we walk it uh, layer by layer. The bottom, the simplest representation of this picture is just one client speaking to one server. Um, the web is a strongly client server, so asymmetric, not symmetric architecture. You have web servers sitting there and doing nothing. Nothing. Doing nothing unless some client are contacting them to request some information, to request some web page, to request some action. So the browsers are the clients demanding some service. The servers are just there waiting to be contacted, contacted by any client uh, with some kind of request. A server is not able, will never be able to contact a browser. There will be never any communication from a web server to a browser initiated by the server. Every communication is always initiated by the browser. The browser asks, the server replies. The browser requests, the server responds. Okay? If a server needs to tell you something, it will need to wait until you ask him anything, and then he can reply with some information. This is a topic that we'll touch later. But basically, uh, just uh, it's a very asymmetric uh, architecture. Uh, when I use the word server, actually, I have two meanings in mind. One can be a logical server. It's a layer of software that implements some functionalities for responding to client requests. And we, this will be the main meaning of the word server, a software that implements the functionality of responding to requests. There is also another uh, meaning of the word server, uh, the physical one. So a physical server is a machine, is a hardware. It's something that is a physical machine that will run the, so the software. This distinction is important because <coughs> in uh, small architectures, you will have the same, the same physical server that will run different layers of software servers. So one machine that will run the web server, the application server, the database server, and something else on the same machine or the same physical machine. On a larger infrastructure, if you are running uh, Facebook, for example, uh, you will need uh, many physical machines uh, to split the load of, a, of one only logical layer. So the web layer 
where the web server will be, which is one logical layer, will be split across maybe thousands of physical servers. So there's not a one-to-one -one mapping. Depending on the load, on the capacity of the web service, the number of physical servers per logical server may be less than one or maybe more than one. Hmm? But mainly, we will talk, when talking about the architecture, we will mainly talk about the logical role of the different software. So when, we, when I say server, or we think uh, software. Hmm? Software doing something. So a web server is one of the, of the main type of servers in the web applications, in web architectures. It is the one piece of software that manages, that has one job in, in, in its life, it has only one thing to do in its life, is to manage the HTTP protocol. A web server is a standard software component that is able to manage the HTTP protocol. We will see what, what HTTP implies. Basically, it's a server that waits, it's a software that waits until a request comes. When a request comes, from whom? From the client, from any client in the world, which is connected through the internet to me. When a request comes, the server analyzes the request, checks whether it's valid, and finds a response or computer response to give back to the client requesting the service. So, and the request may imply maybe a static information, static page, an image, something like that, or more likely it will imply some computation, some dynamic computation. Computing the web page that you are going to see in that moment. That web page didn't exist one moment before, it only started to exist when you click on the link. And the browser sends a request to the server, the server will create the web page for you in this moment and will send you back with a copy of that page. And then we'll forget about that the server. You will have it, you can read it. The actual construction of the web page is outside the scope of the web server. It's the application code that you write. It's only your code that knows what kind of response to give to the user. So we will have a mix of standard software, the web server that manages the protocol, the interaction, the connectivity, and the custom software, the, web, the code that I write to implement the logic functionality of my specific application. They need to live together. Hmm? Uh, we see the details. Uh, the HTTP protocol is in its basic form, now the current versions are much more improved, but the basic form implies one different request, one different, sorry, TCP connection for every HTTP request. So every time you click on a link, you open one Maybe you will see tanks of different HTTP connections to the same server. So the server, before I said, sits there waiting. Well, usually it sits there waiting only if there are no users requesting anything. But when users are requesting many pages per second, many thousands of pages per second, the web server will be very, very busy to serve all the users at the same time simultaneously. And so actually, it's, um, the efficiency of the web server depends on how much or how well uh, the, the software is able to handle all the parallelism of having maybe hundreds of pending requests uh, at a time. Hmm? But we are not too much concerned about uh, uh, performance here, so we'll skip this description. So basically, graphically, what, what, what happens? Uh, what happens is that the client a browser wants to know something. And in the web uh, speak, it means that it has a URL, and a web address that it wants to fetch. It wants to get the information that is behind this web address. How does it do it? Well, the browser will send a, an HTTP request to the web server. So a request message using the HTTP protocol. It's something very simple. The web server will receive this request, will decode it according to the rules of the HTTP protocol, and say, okay, this user wants this file written in the HTML language, for example, this web page. 
imagine the web pages that you, you created for your project. And the web server only fetches this file and sends it back to the client by packaging it into an envelope according to the HTTP response, the, to the HTTP protocol response format, to the format of HTTP responses, okay? On the internet, these two packages travel. Hmm? The, the, the goal of the web server is just to an analyze the request and compose the response by putting together the HTML content that has been provided by the programmer of the website. What the browser does is to receive the HTML code and show it to you, format it to you on screen, lay out, lay it out, lay out the columns, the colors, uh, the borders, the fonts, uh, all the graphic, gra graphical issues, okay? Uh, the technologies for uh, realizing this, and this, uh, I mean, we go back to the 1992 or three. This technology started to work in this way. Uh, and it requires only very few technologies to work. The ability of having a universal and uniform way of addressing any resource in the world. If you have a URL, a web address, HTTP slash uh, uh, something, something slash, it, it, uh, this string identifies uniquely one web page across the whole internet. And so in a very short and simple string, you have the key for accessing any kind of resources. And it's the only information that the client needs to get the web page. We need a, a language which is uh, neutral, technology neutral, for representing web pages. Just imagine that a web page is something that has been written by one person in one side of the world and is being read by a different person on the other side of the world. These two persons will share or nothing, can share nothing, can have different languages, different computers, different operating systems, will live in different continents and so on. So for the web, to exist, you could not have chosen, oh, I will send you a Word file, for example. Because there's no guarantee that on the other side of the world, the person reading, reading that page will have Word in the version that you needed. So they needed to develop a language that was universal. Who writes the HTML pages doesn't know what kind of computer their users are going to use. I'm writing an HTML page. I don't know if you are, will, you are, if you are going to visit that, that page from a PC, from a Mac, from a mobile, from an iPad, or whatever. Yes? Yes. The question was uh, about fonts. Yeah, what? Yes. yes. Uh, what, uh, what can we do to customize the fonts? Um, the simple answer is nothing. Well, uh, meaning that you see the web fonts were introduced uh, in 2000 and uh, started to be supported only well, here in the Firefox 3.5 and uh, uh, Chrome 4 in the year 2010. The issue is that when, you are, when I specify a font in the HTML file, HTML file is just a simple text file. I will say font equal to Arial. If the, on your computer there is no Arial installed, your browser will do its best, its best to match the request, Arial font, with the, uh, one font that is actually installed in your computer. There's no guarantee. So uh, when they develop HTML, they say, 
uh, decided on a very small subset of fonts, uh, one fixed, uh, one serif, uh, one uh, um, monospace, uh, and something like that, three or four fonts that should be always available. Uh, but, and then uh, you can specify a list of fonts by preference. So render this with this font, if not with this other, you see a list, every time you specify a font, you will actually need to specify a list. And the list will need, needs to end with one generic font that will always be available. Can be different for every user. You cannot rely on pixel perfect design. Web fonts that were introduced recently are a way to download fonts over the web. So it's a technology invented by Google that uh, uh, will be able to specify in your web page an, a URL from which to, to download a font, so the browser will use that font that has been downloaded in the moment. Hmm? But not every browser supports it. Hmm? But uh, it's, um, it's, it's, I think the, the font issue is a general concept. You don't know the fonts that are installed in the machine. You don't know the screen resolution. Maybe a small screen in a mobile phone. You may be a very wide screen in a desktop workstation. When you write the HTML, you don't know that. You need to plan ahead and create your content so that it will be laid out correctly and meaningfully over a wide range of devices, wide range of fonts, a wide range of operating systems, wide range of languages, and so on. Hmm? That's one of the challenges. Uh, and express everything with a standard language that, uh, that every browser will understand, which is the HTML language, which is very simple. And all the communication always goes through this HTTP protocol, hmm? which has been mentioned thousands of times, but uh, actually it's very simple. Uh, it seems the protocol, what it is, that actually you will see it's very simple. All the interaction is managed by this very simple protocol. Is so simple, well, it, it was so successful because it's so simple. But uh, since it's so simple, it will create a lot of problems later. Hmm? We'll see that. Uh, so the basic uh, uh, fundamental uh, skills for creating websites are, well, we need to be able to write some HTML code. What I can say to you uh, is go to this website and there are tutorials, there are the references uh, to help you be started with this HTML language. But actually it's very, very simple. HTML is just one, uh, sorry, uh, let me go there. If the, no, does it work? Let's see. It doesn't like me today. Okay. Second try, last try. Okay. No. We we'll skip it. Uh, the idea is that HTML is a very simple text language. So everything you write, it will be a text document, and the formatting instructions are inside the so called tags. Text are text commands in square brackets, like this. Less than and greater than signs. There is one tag for creating a new paragraph. It's called P. There is a tag for creating an image. It's called IMG. There's a tag for creating a heading. It's called H1 or H2 for a second level heading and so on. There's a tag for italics. It's called I. For bold, it's called B and so on. So. Uh, you have a text that describes the content of the page with uh, tag markers that just mark and highlight the text in different uh, uh, portions. But uh, I'm sorry the, the Wi-Fi is not working right, uh, right now, but we'll create some HTML later when we do the exercise on our own web server so we don't need the internet to. But actually, you, you can get started in, in five minutes, really, for the basic web pages. Okay, so it's not an issue. Then if you want to do something more complex, multi-column layouts and so on, then of course it will get more complex. Huh? But uh, uh, the starting point is very easy. 
So we say the three basic technologies are HTML, HTTP, and URLs. URLs are just addresses, uh, strings that describe resources. A resource uh, is composed of three main portions. One is uh, the server that's, that hosts the resource. The second is the path inside the server at which that resource lives. And the third is the protocol by which we can get that resource. In web technologies, the protocol is always HTTP. The URLs are open also for other kinds of protocols in the past and in the future. But if we are talking about web technologies, the protocol is either HTTP or HTTPS for the encrypted version. And then you have the server name and the path name. What happens when you click uh, on a name or when you write uh, an address in your browser? The first thing that, that happens is that the, your browser needs to map the name of the server into an IP address. So the internet runs on IP addresses. These are IP version, version 4 addresses. There are four decimal numbers from 0 to 255 each, okay? Every computer connected with the internet must have one IP address. The servers must have so-called public IP addresses. So IP addresses reachable by, any, by anybody in the world. We never remember IP addresses. We don't ask our users to write IP addresses. We use symbolic names to refer to our servers. So this, for example, is one symbolic name that refers to this web server that hosts our website for the course. How can the browser of my friend in China know that uh, elite.polito.it maps to this address? The browser will not know. The browser will query one, one of the subsystems in the internet protocols, which is called the DNS system, domain name system, which is a distributed database, a very huge dictionary that maps all the names to their IP addresses. It's distributed, so there is no single central point with the list of the full names but it's a complex uh, set, set of queries. We are not interested in that. What we need to know is that the, the, the first thing that the browser needs to do is to map the name to an address. Otherwise, it cannot contact the server. Contacting the server means opening a connection on a specific IP address, not name. So first of all, we need to translate names into addresses. At that point, we can open a connection TCP IP connection, actually a TCP connection to this address using the syntax specified by this protocol. And on this connection, what are we doing? On this connection, we are sending an HTTP request containing the path name of the resource that we want to get. So the browser creates this HTTP request, which is a small text file containing this part of the URL, the local path name, and will send it to the IP address that has been computed from the host name. This request goes to the server wakes it up, because the server up, up till now was, was not aware that the client ever existed, and uh, receives the request, does some analysis and rewriting of this request, so it will map this logical name, public path name of the resource, into an internal file name, a physical name, into the hard disks of uh, the server, we will read the file and we'll send the file back. So the different parts of the URLs are used in different steps <coughs> of the web connections. 
basically the browser only cares uh, with this part and the server only cares with the right part hmm? because it's already been contacted so he knows who it is, the server. Well, uh, URIs are even more complex that can contain uh, paths, uh, can contain parameters when sometimes you, can, you have a question mark uh, that is used to add some parameters to some address. So you pass not just, you are not just requesting a resource, but you're requesting a resource with some additional information, with some additional parameters. Your username, for example. Hmm? Or we'll see it, uh, some specific port. Ports are a concept in the uh, IP protocol that uh, enable to have different connections on the same machines uh, with a different number. Uh, uh, usually, the HTTP protocol works on port number 80. Um, but when the, the, the when we develop uh, our own application, we will not use port 80 because port 80 is a so-called privileged port. It's only used by the system processes, processes that have the root permissions and so on, and is usually blocked by, for example, the Polytechnic of firewalls for avoiding that everybody puts uh, some public web server inside the Polytechnic. So we will use some non-standard port and we can specify this number here, hmm? but it's not a complex concept. So about the uh, HTTP protocol, back to the roots. What travels on the internet when, you, when we click? Actually, I captured the HTTP protocol of myself yesterday loading the, um, the homepage of the Elite uh, website. So when you open the eli.polita.it homepage, your browser, before contacting the server, so maybe you never saw the server before, creates this, or similar to this, file. Let's call it file, message. It's a text message composed of uh, two main lines, and other option, optional, let's say, attributes. The first line is the most important one, get slash HTTP 1.1. The first is the verb, the action, what I'm requesting. Get means I want that file. I want that resource. Get me a copy of that. There are a handful of commands in HTTP. Get, put, post, uh, options, head, and... Uh, couple of more, delete, but 99%, no, 95% of the requests are get and the, rest, the remaining 5% are post. Get, the verb, the object, what do I want to get? Slash, the root, the home page, the initial page, the starting page of the website. Otherwise here, instead of the slash, I will have the local part of the URL. Protocol version. This browser is able to speak the HTTP protocol up to version 1.1. So the server is entitled to respond with any version of HTTP protocol up to 1.1. If it can support 1.1, it will use 1.1. If it only supports 1.0, it doesn't happen, but uh, it will respond with 1.0. If the server supports 2.0, we'll use 1.1 anyway. Hmm? It's called protocol negotiation. In the first exchange of information, I tell you what are the, high, the highest level of language I can understand. And you will be bound to respond to me with this, that language, that level, if you can speak it, or lower. Hmm? Host tells to the server its name. So the browser tells the server, you are elite.polita.it. The server already knows that. Why is this parameter needed? Because on the same physical machine, we may have different websites running. So I need to tell to the server, I want the home page of this website, 
not on other websites that may be running on the same physical, not of other logical websites that are running on the same physical machine. The IP address is mapped to a physical machine, not to a logical one. Hmm? So I need also to disambiguate in the case in which the server is going to run many websites, actually. All the other information is information about uh, the browser. The browser tells you a, a valid HTTP request is only composed of these two lines. All the rest is optional. The browser, to help the server respond better, gives to the server more information. For example, the, the version of the browser, it introduces itself. I'm version, I'm the browser version such and such and such, running on Windows uh, on this version and so on. And every time you click, a fingerprint of your browser, your operating system is sent to any website you are visiting. They know everything about, uh, about you. The browser tells you, the server, that it will be happy to accept HTML files as a response, or even HTML files, or even XML files, or anything else if needed. This queue is the preferences. So it's a sort of, they, they call it content negotiation. If the server has the same resource in different formats, the browser will tell the server which are the formats that are preferred and the languages that are preferred. I prefer Italian if the resource is available, otherwise in English it's okay with a lower preference. This is not something that, that they have said, but when you are installing a browser onto an, a localized operating system, the browser itself knows, no? infers, understands your preferences. And if the browser won't know, uh, if the server wants, it can, can compress the response using one of these algorithms and so on. So the HTTP protocol just specifies which are the valid uh, commands here, valid properties, and the browser fills the values that are applicable to this request. HTTP request, this format. When you think HTTP request, think get path. The server never knew you in, uh, before. It never even suspected that you are alive. And it received this packet from a computer somewhere in the world. And it obeys to the command. Somebody wants to get the home page of the website, okay, the server will process the request and will send back an HTTP response. So the HTTP protocol is made of a request format and a response format. The response format is not dissimilar from the request. It also, it, it has two parts actually, one header from here to there and one body. The body is actually the file that they want. The other is other information that is attached to the response. The body in this case is the HTML file composing the page. The other will always start with the, the most important line. You see HTTP 1.0, 200, okay. In this case, the server replies, I want to speak protocol version 1.0, not 1.1. So at this point, the, the two have negotiated the protocol. And then there is the code that says the, um, the result of the operation. There are all three digit codes. All the numbers that start with two are positive codes. No error. All the codes that start with three are redirection codes. Well, the resource is there, but not in this location. You need to modify some. Starting with four are user errors. Starting with five are server errors. So the so-called four, code 404 stands for page not found. Hmm? You have seen it. In this case, 200 means uh, page found. Here it is, at the bottom, in the body. So from the first line, I already know that the page is okay, 
okay, is the text, text version of code 200. These two are redundant. You have the numeric form and the string form for the same message. And then you have the body. And here you have a lot of other attributes or parameters of the response. So this is information from the server to the browser that qualifies the response. It says, okay, this response is being um, encoded with the, uh, compressed with gzip protocol. It's in HTML. It's encoded in, in a Unicode uh, with Unicode characters. This is the date at which the, this page has been, this request has been served. So the date of now. And uh, this response uh, will expire in the past. So it's already expired. This expiration date is useful because if you have uh, maybe an image or log of your website which is not changing every day, you can tell the browser, well, okay, this, e this image will expire in two months. So if the browser needs to request the same image again, it will check and we'll see that you already the browser already has a copy of it, and this copy is not yet expired, so we'll not request it again. It will make navigation faster. But in this case, well, the home page of the website is generated dynamically. It makes no sense to remember it. Every time you need it, you need to regenerate it from fresh. That's why it already gives you an expired page. Don't remember this. If you need to show it again, ask me for a new version. And uh, again, the, the server introduces itself. What are the version of the server, the name of the server, its version, and the operating system version, something like that. And that's it. The CGP protocol is just 15 pages that just tells you the details about all these uh, the different uh, attributes that can be attached. So it's very simple. After this response, the browser and the server disconnect. And they forget about each other. They really forget about each other. The server in one millisecond after doesn't remember about the browser, the client. And if the client asks a new page to the same server one millisecond after, from the point of view of the server, it's a totally new request. So we need to start from the beginning, who am I, what kind of protocol do I speak, and so on. We say that the HTTP protocol is a stateless protocol, a protocol with no state. Nothing is remembered from one interaction to the next one. This is what makes it simple, and what, make, what, will, what will make complex to, to add a state to our applications later. But, Uh, if you want to play or see what happens, uh, in this case, uh, my suggestion is to open the developer tools that are available in all the modern browsers in which you can see what happens uh, when you open a page uh, and you see, uh, now it's, uh, it's timing out so we don't see anything, but uh, here uh, you will see everything that happens right here, and you see also the headers of the request and the response and so on. So you can apply, while you navigate websites, uh, these tools uh, will uh, actually record what you are doing and you can see, you can check it. So if, if you want to understand better, it's, uh, it's very easy to do. It's already embedded in, in all the modern browsers, uh, Firefox, Chrome, Internet Explorer. Just go to the, to the developer tools menu. Hmm? Okay, um, let's skip this. So up to now, what do we have? We have uh, in mind a picture where the user, happy, is using a browser. A browser among the different dozen or so available ones, depending on the operating system you have, your preference and whatever. It interacts using display, of course, and the mouse or keyboard. On the other part of the world, there's a web server. 
the actions of the user cause the request of a URL, the, the cause the creation of a request, trigger the sending of a request. And what are the actions of the, of the user? Clicking on a link or writing an address. Only two things can the user do. When the user clicks on a link, the browser understands the URL corresponding to that link and composes an HTTP request for that URL and sends it through the internet to the web server. The web server in some way fetches the HTML file and sends it back as an HTTP response. This response reaches the browser and the browser will interpret the response interpret the, the HTML language of the response and use its own uh, layout engine, its own algorithms for showing it to you on the screen. Okay. If uh, the web page contains some images, uh, images are also fetched uh, and uh, are sent back uh, and the layout engine will position them in different, in different paths. One point to note is that uh, any image in a web page is a separate file. You have the HTML file, which is the text of the page, and then images are link, are separated, separate files that are uh, requested in separate requests from the browser. So the browser first gets the HTML file. The HTML file contains a lot of re external references to images, to style sheets, to scripts, and so on. And for each of these external references, the browser will initiate a new request. And the server will reply with a separate response, independent from the others. And if you see with the developer tools, you see that for one, when, when you do one click, it will trigger maybe 20 different requests. The, HTML, the first one will be always the HTML file, and then we'll, you will find all the images, all the style sheets, all the scripts, uh, maybe 20, 25, 40 different files. Uh, so one click mm, uh, so translates into dozens of requests. Okay, this HTML file can be already existing. Already existing means that somebody wrote it by hand. Or in most of the cases, this HTML file is generated on the fly, on the moment, by some application code, by some program that gets activated in the moment and that creates that specific file. Uh, when, whenever you have a web page that is dynamic in nature, the content may change. There's always a script, a program that will generate one specific instance, one specific copy of that page for every request. You may have 1,000 requests per second, will be 1,000 different pages being generated. Maybe they are identical, but they're generated one per request. Okay, web servers. Web servers are, I said at the beginning, standard software components. They all do the same job. Receive HTTP requests, find the resource, and reply with an HTTP response. So the world has been has converged, has standardized over a handful of different web servers. The most popular one is the Apache open source server, which runs mainly on Linux servers. And you see that the others are contending uh, the 15% mark in this uh, share graph. Hmm? Uh, there was a surge in Microsoft some years ago, but uh, when they started off uh, free hosting. There is a surge here in the recent years about this Google server. When you, are, when you open a Google site, you are running on the Google server, but uh, most Google servers also run Apache. So most of the web servers are using, you know, means more, more than half of the web servers on the internet are using the same software. This software implements the standard part of the HTTP protocol. Of course, whenever you need to create a page, 
the standard software will need help from one custom software, which is your application that knows what is in, this, in that page. So you have a very nice split between handling the protocol, the communication, and the network, and handling the content. Handling the content is a programmer's job. Handling the connectivity is web server's job. And the web server is nothing that you need to program. It's already there. You just install it, and that's it. We will not use any of this. We'll use uh, something that we surround is 0% uh, for development, uh, which is Python servers uh, that we'll see later on. OK, so I said uh, the web server is a standard component, so it doesn't know anything about your website. Your website is uh, a collection of software that knows how to create every page, specific page, specific for your site. And it's being contained in what we call an application server. So it's a different environment from the web server that knows about the application, knows about uh, how to generate dynamically a web page, how to fill the content of a web page, how to authenticate the users, how to query the data in the databases. Huh? Uh, so all uh, the functionality of a website is the responsibility of the application server. Actually, the application server is a misleading name because it's not a server, a, so a standard software component. It usually is made of a framework, a set of libraries, and then a lot of application code that you need to write specifically to, for that website. Hmm? So it's a, an environment in which you may program your application. Let's call it like that. Uh, so in general, what happens when a request arrives to a web server is that the request is not well, we'll never correspond to one HTML file which is already there. We we'll correspond to a specific request for running an application, maybe a method, maybe a function, maybe a script, and this application knows about the logic of the website, and the only purpose in the life of this application is to spit out, to print some HTML. The HTML that will be sent back to the browser, the browser will never know whether that, that HTML has been generated on the fly or was already existing. It doesn't care. What we care is that up to now in this picture, the only part where we need to write code is here. All the rest, browser, protocols, web server, are standard components. Zero effort. Uh, there there is some additional information here about uh, for generating dynamic pages. Dynamic means uh, may change. And uh, it may change if some, um, some data is changed. If you run a program 20 times in a row, it will always give you the same output unless its inputs are different. So there should be a way of giving inputs to Let's make it simple. When you log in on, web, on a website, you write your own password and your own login name. So you are providing data to the application server. And if you're using your password, or sorry, your login, or my login, the response of the server, the content of the HTML page will be different. It will be your contents or my content. Okay, so the logic behaves differently according to some parameters, some data that has been sent by the client. And how can the client, which is a software, the browser, provide some data? Well, the browser needs to provide the user some way to enter the data. Form, text area, button, menus, check boxes, and so on. In which the user can specify some data then when I submit the page, it will be sent to the server. The web server doesn't know what to do with these parameters. The web server is just a standard component that doesn't understand the forms, just passes these parameters down to the application logic. The application logic will understand and accordingly modify the content of the HTML. 
So actually we have this mechanism for passing data, parameters along with web requests, HTTP requests, and a way to a set of programming languages, uh, Python is among them, for implementing this application logic. Uh, this is an example of a script that has, is being passed to some parameter. And all the web parameters, all the web technologies, all web technologies always go around one very simple concept, key value dictionaries. Name equal value. So everything you will see in the web technologies will always be expressed in a form of names and values. We saw it in HTTP when we had names and values, names and values, names and values, names and values. We have them in uh, parameters, in form names. Every form name element, the text area has a name and a value. The name is what I program and the value is what the user puts in. You find this concept everywhere. Sessions, when you see them, are just dictionaries, name, map to value. The name is fixed, it's decided by the programmer or by the standard, and the value is whatever the user puts in. Okay. Um, it didn't change anything. The next step that we won't be able to see today in the practical session, but uh, logically is essential, is uh, the persistence of, persistence of the information. Just imagine this web application, this is your code. The user asks you some web page and you reply, where is the information that this software can use to reply to the user. Right now, in this picture, the only information that is available is what is in the code. You are encoding here in your application, in your software, the content of the pages. Well, it can be dynamic, yes. But if I want to store some information about the user, the list of users, it's not, it must not be in the code the history, the preferences. There's a lot of information that uh, needs to be, we call it persistent. So be there even tomorrow, the next month, the next year. Be there ready to be used when the user needs it. And ready to be changed if the user needs to change it. This is just software. Software will, once it's completed, doesn't exist anymore. The values of variables, if you reboot the server, will be lost. So we need one layer of storage, of persistent storage, into which the web logic can store and manage all the data on behalf of the users, of course. So uh, a long time, uh, this was a very say, early need. Uh, we used uh, what was available. Uh, usually we are using relational databases. So most of you have done a database course, so you know what's a SQL uh, language and what's a DBMS. But uh, it's basically a place, a server, a different component in the architecture whose purpose is to store and manage data with a language for querying it and for modifying it. There's, there's just not be specific right now. It's a different component in which the software can store data and can query that data later on. The application server uh, implements the website logic, but for storing data and for getting all the previous data, it needs to interact with an, an additional external component. 
which is many, in most of the cases, a database. So what, what happens is that when a request arrives to the application server, the application server needs to know, okay, this is the username, this is the password. Is this password correct? How can my software know? It doesn't know. The best that my software can do is to query a database to check whether that username and that password are actually correct. And if the data in the database matches with the data provided by the user. And if so, well, then it locks the user in. And maybe this make, it makes a second query to the database for getting the preferences of the user. Does the user speak Italian or English? The software doesn't know, but the database maybe has the information stored about the user preferences. And then what are the latest messages of this user? Let's query the, the, the database about what are the latest messages for this user. So the database also, always has all the information about the status, the state of the system. HTTP has no state. Software here, logic, is something that just dies after every request. No? The, the nature of the HTTP protocol is just to forget about the, the client right after a response has been given. So there must be an, another component which is persistent in nature. These two guys, the application server and the database server, are very, very different in terms of conception. And it creates problems because they actually were, databases were uh, invented and conceived and developed uh, much before the web and with a very different application architecture model in mind. So it's a bit of a force, a forced match and they don't, they, don't, they don't fit very well together, but actually it's a necessity and we are using them. If we had to reinvent something today, it would be different. But uh, we saw the timeline. Nothing was invented right at the beginning. Everything was added when, when it was needed. So we have to live with that. So, but actually in our application, in our mind, we have one database that stores information and the, there will be a continuous chat in form of queries between the application logic and the database for getting data, for modifying them, for storing them, and so on. The database, again, is a standard component. Like the web server, it's a standard software component. The database is a standard software component. You can use MySQL, you can use PostgreSQL, you can use uh, um, other files, uh, uh, sorry, uh, file-based uh, databases, I don't remember the name right now. Um, many, my libraries or service exist, you don't need to write it or to create a database system. What you need to create is a structure of the data and of course the, con the schema and of course the contents of the data itself, the data instances. So you need to design how, what, how to organize the data, but then uh, all the rest is just uh, using an existing software. So basically, again, all the responsibility, all the specificity of your application lies here in the application logic. Um, okay. Uh, the idea, just let me show you an example. This uh, is in uh, PHP. We don't care, but the idea is the same. What, just imagine a page in which you want to search for some content. So the user has specified a query by entering some words in a text area, or maybe one word in a text area. Submits the query, and then the server receives this query. And this is an example of the code that the server will run to respond to that, that query. So what the server does is just to dollar request query means extract the query from the HTTP request. 
This will be a string. We use this string, maybe I wanted query is coffee. I wrote coffee, and so here we get coffee. And this word is being uh, used to compose a SQL query. Select a doc ID from key doc index keyword where key doc index dot key ID equal keywords dot ID and keywords dot key equal coffee. We may or may not may not like or we may or may not know a SQL, but the concept is that we are creating a query that is based on some parameters that come from the user. This in particular is a huge security problem, but we are not concerned with security on this slide. So, but just bear in mind, never do this. Hmm? We come to security, it may, it may be late. Um, and what do I do with this query? Just a string at the application level. The application sends this, this string that contains a query to the database by using a library function, for example, MySQL query. The database receives this string, looks at it, analyzes it, and if it's okay, it will execute the commands implied by that query. And we'll build a result, a table with the results of that query. This table is, in this case, is called the row set, the set of the rows of the result. Imagine a table made of many rows. And then one row at a time, there's a loop, one row at a time, you extract the results and do something with those. Maybe put them into your web page. So there is some information, the price of the coffee or the nearest coffee machine, which is buried down inside the database. You have a query coming from the user, and the application logic is putting together the two. It's taking the, the information request or the need from the user from the data in the database, merges them to create an HTML page in which we have the response in a user visible and legible and understandable form. So in many cases, uh, you have uh, application logic that is made of some part dealing with the user and some part of the user request, some part dealing with the database, and some part dealing with the user response, maybe, I mean, the HTML response, uh, and all in the application logic. So actually, in our picture, we just added one ingredient down there. The web application is not just a lang, it doesn't just do everything by itself, but whenever the application needs to read or store any data, it can query the, the database server that manages the data, uh, the real data. So again, you see that this component is green like the web server because it's a standard component. The browser is standard, the web server is standard, database server is standard. The database contents uh, is our, our design, but most of the work is here in the application software. Right now, with this picture, we are in uh, 1992, 1995, when we gave to the user the ability of clicking on links and of writing data into forms. But if you see it, uh, when a web page is received and is laid out on the screen, no interactivity is possible. The kind of application that we are using today are much more interactive. When you have a page, you see an item that appears, disappear, pop-ups, menus, and uh, updates, and so on. How can that happen? It happens because we found a way to write some programs also inside the browser. Today, browsers are not just layout engines. 
to you say, present you in good shape uh, an HTML code, but also contain an interpreter for a language, which is the, the JavaScript language. So what happens is that in the HTML file, I can have, of course, references to images. I can have reference to style sheets. We'll learn them next week. I can also have references to JavaScript files or scripts. These scripts, if they're references, referenced by the HTML file, they will be requested by the browser, they will be loaded, sent by the server, and loaded by the browser, and run, interpreted by this JavaScript engine. So what happens is that the web developer is developing the server-side application, the server portion of the application, some code that runs on the server, and some code that will run into the browser of my friends all over the world. So that after the page has been received and the connection has been, has been cut, there is some code that is still running on your browser. So when you visit my site, my website, I will send you some software that will run on your browser, the perfect virus, okay? Your browser is running a code from any website that you visit and you are trusting them. Fortunately, this uh, runtime engine is very, very protected. So the, the, if, if we don't have, uh, except from bugs or security issues. But the idea is that the, the software that is being running on our client's uh, browsers is very limited in, in capability. It cannot see anything outside the browser, basically, or even anything outside the current web page. But uh, by putting some code into the browser, it will enable a better interactivity of the user with the page. So when the user moves the mouse, this JavaScript code can be informed and can modify the, the page, for example. I move the mouse there, an image changes, a menu appears or disappears. So I can program the dynamic behavior of a web page after it doesn't mean loaded. It's a client side dynamic behavior. After it doesn't mean loaded, by sending some JavaScript code that is able to react locally on the browser to the user actions. And JavaScript is JavaScript not JavaScript or other languages. You see that on the server side, I can choose different languages. Because it's my server, I develop on my server with the language I want. But this JavaScript must, will run on every browser of every kind from any of my users. So it must be one language for everybody. Okay. Microsoft tried at one time to push another language what, it was a competitor to JavaScript. It was called VBScript. Nobody remembers it anymore, okay? Uh, because it must be one language that will run on every browser with compatibility issues that will always be there. And the only thing that the JavaScript engine can do is to interact with the page. The software that I run here will interact with the layout engine and so we'll be able to read what's in the page, understand what the user is doing, and modify the page accordingly. So giving the dynamic impression to the page hmm? uh, by adding this. So we will need at least to create a simple application, not a complex one, a simple one. We will need at least to be more or less proficient in HTML, some programming language, let's say Python, and the libraries of the application server that we'll use in Python, and uh, SQL, if we want to query some database and to store some data, 
and uh, some uh, style sheets for giving a layout which is more or less 2015 looking and not 1995 looking. And of course, some JavaScript to give some dynamic appearance to the website. Hmm? At the least. Uh, it was not invented in one day. Otherwise, probably they, it would, would have been more standardized. Hmm? But everything is built on top. And this even before we start talking about Web 2.0 with all the dynamic content creation, uh, automatic updating, and so on, where I just will show you one additional picture. We had one simple arrow, but a very destructive one. So what uh, could we achieve with JavaScript? We made very fancy pages. But since the connection to the server is cut right after the HTML and the images and style sheets and JavaScript scripts are being sent, it's a private relationship between the JavaScript code and the user. The server is not involved anymore. So you can make the page as fancy as you like, but the information that page has is only that information that was already there at the beginning. You cannot do anything dynamic. If some data changes, how can that page be informed? So they invented a new way for enabling the JavaScript code to query the web server asynchronously for updating information. What do I mean asynchronously? The difference between an HTTP request, a normal HTTP request, and then a synchronous call is that in a normal HTTP request, the response page will replace the current page. If you click on a link, the previous page is dead, and you get to a new page. The previous one is dead. Synchronous. Request, response, new page. In the asynchronous case, the page stays there. The JavaScript keeps running. I do a request to the web server, asynchronous to the page changes. So it doesn't, it's not related with the page changes. And when the response, the response comes, I will process it in the JavaScript page, code, sorry, the JavaScript code. And the page doesn't change. And then the JavaScript code may decide to modify the page. One example, autocomplete. When you write a query, you start writing the first two letters, and you find, and uh, immediately, suddenly, a list of the completions appears. So how can your browser or the JavaScript knows about what are all the possible completions of what you have been written here, or what, or, or what you will be writing there? It doesn't know. It cannot know everything in the world. What you, it cannot know what you are expecting to write. When you write the first letter, the JavaScript code will tell just the server, well, this user started to write this. Do you have any completions to suggest? <laughs> While you're writing, while you're on the page, they are chatting continuously. The JavaScript in your page and the server on a separate channel, on an asynchronous channel, on top of the HTTP protocol. So the HTTP protocol will be used both for sending new pages and for chatting, for exchanging data asynchronously. And so the server will reply, okay, with the letter D, you may have this set of completions, and send back not a page, not an HTML page, but a set of data, an array, a list of data. This list is kept by the JavaScript engine, and if needed, it will update the page. When you write another letter, then the JavaScript will tell the server, oh, there's a second letter there, how can you improve the suggestion? And it will send back the, the improvement, and so on. So it's all asynchronous. The user is doing things, the page is doing things, the server is uh, being queried, queen continues and gives, giving information back. So it's a very complex programming model. In the mind of the programmer, you have three moments. The generation of the page, easy, old style. I write an HTML and then forget about this. The interactivity on the page, 
the JavaScript that just is there for making fancy animations, and the parallel asynchronous activity, chats between page and server on one side, JavaScript and, and server on one side, and JavaScript and user on the other side, which happen at different speeds and with different contents. And this gets complex, of course. There are also frameworks, programming libraries for reason that in JavaScript, of course. Okay, uh, we will focus on this level for the moment. So right after the break, we will learn how to do this in Python. <laughs>